<laughs> uh, welcome to session three of the basic elements of evidence management online training class. Uh, if you are here for online evidence management training, then you're in the right place. If you're not, I don't know how you got here, but it's a little weird that you popped on. But uh, go ahead and sit a spell and, and listen and <laughs> learn something new. Uh, just want to kind of bring your attention to a couple things. We're going to try to we're try to spend a lot less time on making introductions and housekeeping yep. items. But I do want to encourage you, if you're not a member of the Evidence Management Community Forum on Facebook, I want to encourage you to join that. I'll put another link in the window. In fact, I'll do that now. Should go in the chat window. If I can do it. So that'll be there. Uh, would encourage you to join that. It's just another place to build community and get answers to your questions. Uh, we try to post stuff there on a regular basis as well. So would encourage you to check that out. <clears throat> and a little clicker, get it working. And it's not going to work. So we will do something else. We'll go to plan B. Uh, so you're in the right place. Sock this puppets. Yes. This is uh, session three. Today we're going to talk about digital evidence. We'll talk about packaging, labeling, and sealing evidence, and we're going to talk about the intake process. Uh, if you missed sessions one or two, those are both available online. There's a link on the evidencemanagement.com website that will take you to those classes. It's a little tricky to find. We'll work on making that a little more clear and plain, but I uh, want to encourage you to, to catch up while you can. Those will be available 24-7 online. I uh, also want to kind of shout out to Tracker Products. Uh, free training is not necessarily free. It costs somebody something. But, uh, because of our partnership with Tracker Products, they make uh, evidence management software. Uh, we're able to do this online training class. So I don't, I, I, I love doing this for free and making this something that is of no cost uh, to you as an evidence custodian. Absolutely. Uh, I hope it is of value to you as an evidence custodian, but it is possible because we partner with Tracker Products as a software vendor. Also want to spend maybe two minutes talking about 20 in 2020. Um, last week was a pretty cool week. Uh, there are only really 12 evidence management associations across the state. Last week, we kind of started the, the process working with the state of Minnesota. They had a property evidence association uh, many years ago that went defunct, but there is a lot of interest and there are a lot of people on this call. So if you're in the state of Minnesota, I would encourage you to go to our website and maybe put the little, put your name and email address in the forum because we're trying to start a new association or reform an old association in Minnesota. And we would love to help facilitate that process. Yes. Also, if you're in the state of Oklahoma, there is interest in Oklahoma as well. Uh, we would love to, by the end of this year, have 20 new associations in, in 2020. I think that's possible if people just kind of work together. So without any further ado, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Today we're talking again about digital evidence, about packaging, labeling, and sealing evidence, and then we're going to talk about the intake and submission process. At the end, there will be a little question and answer session that's optional. You're more than welcome to attend and post questions. But uh, the, the class itself is going to be an hour long. If uh, you tuned in last week, you know that digital evidence, we were supposed to do that at the end of the class last week, but we've had to kind of shuffle things around. That's going to happen. I mean, this is the first time this training has been provided or produced. Uh, it's extremely condensed. So we're, we're learning on the fly, and we appreciate your patience. There are, Absolutely. Notes, there are notes for this class uh, on the PDF. There should be a PDF in the webinar window. They're also available on the Facebook page. They're available on my website at evidencemanagement.com. Uh, I try to post the notes as early as possible to my page, my client page. So sign up for, uh, for an account. It's free. We're not going to, we're not going to do anything untoward uh, with your information, but that's, that's how we can kind of keep it protected. Uh, so if I can click the right button, that is a much younger version of James. Oh, that no. Much, that is a much younger version of me. Wow, so, where'd you find that at? 
that was that was from the archives. Uh, but <laughs> hey, you know, do... uh, I wanted to be the superhero, so you know, maybe next week I, I get to play superhero. And <laughs> if you, dre- and if you, you dress up, <laughs> yeah, you send me a picture. I promise I will post it. I always All right. want to be. I always want to be Robin for some reason. Right. Uh, it never really resonated with me because <laughs> I think he got to wear shorts. Uh, so today <laughs> let's just let's just start talking about digital evidence. Let's uh, let's start where we left off last week. A couple of working definitions, and James, you had a couple of points specifically about digital evidence that I would I would love for you to share, just at the yeah. very beginning. Yeah. Are you ready for it? So. Digital, uh, digital evidence, digital media, we know is such a complex form of evidence handling. Um, when it's stored in a database in your department's care, does that belong to evidence? Is it physical evidence, virtual evidence? I don't think we really have clear cut definitions yet, but uh, Sean's got some good information and we're gonna try and outline it. But the thing I wanted to stress the most is that digital evidence is trending. There are so many new developments, uh, specifically like our agency, uh, we're having a, a new software that we're not developing, but it's it's purchased and requires the phone to stay powered on at all times. So think about that in terms of your intake and your submission process. If an investigator or deputy is coming in to book in a phone, they're bypassing all that traditional uh, packaging and chain of custody, and they're putting it into a locker that has uh, a power cord so that the phone can stay on until our forensic folks can get to it. So that's just one example of, uh, of ways that we're trying to accommodate uh, digital evidence now in the modern world. Yeah, the, the one thing we can, we can say definitively about digital evidence is it's going to look different three months from now, a month from now than it does today. Absolutely. It, it is rapidly evolving. And I remember looking at my evidence vault at the police department and I could have fit in, I think in 05, all of the digital evidence at our agency could have fit in a shoebox. And you could just look at the shelves of CDs and DVDs and see the exponential growth of just storage on, on DVD and CD. It was exponential. And now it's difficult to see the growth because most of that's happening on servers, but it's still, it's still a tidal wave. Just a few working definitions to get us started with. When we talk about digital evidence, we're talking about, it's a broad term. It's any electronically stored data that is associated with a criminal case. Uh, so it is an incredibly, maybe even an overbroad term, but digital evidence can be data or files that are stored on servers, data that is extracted from devices, data that sits on hardware devices. So it's a very broad term, but basically the data is the key unifying factor when we talk about digital evidence. And when we talk about digital evidence, sometimes you'll hear us use a term asset, a digital asset. That's kind of an interchangeable term for a file or a specific instance of digital evidence. So if I use those terms interchangeably, I'm, I'm talking about a specific file, an electronic file that's associated with a criminal case, uh, whether where, regardless of where it resides. And we'll get into that a little more. When we yes. talk about digital storage media, we're talking about where the data resides. Uh, most of that is going to either be on a server or an optical disk, like a CD or a DVD. Uh, some of it will be resident on hardware devices, cell phones. That's, you know, the black box in a vehicle. Uh, those types of storage places, CPUs, for those of us who remember them. Uh, you know, those are those are digital storage devices that that the important thing about them is the ev- the data inside. So that's something to keep in mind. It's also important to think about legacy storage. I know most of you probably don't have a VHS player at home. I don't. Uh, but if you've got legacy data on legacy devices, uh, that's what we're talking about. Stuff that nobody uses anymore. The little icon for saving things on your screen. For those of you who weren't around during the five and a quarter or the three and a half inch floppy drive era, that was a that's a that's a legacy storage device. It's something that reminds us of our ancient heritage and roots. So when we talk about digital evidence, I want to go over just a few of the standards. And and when I refer to standards and best practices, these are things that we've published on our 
standards and best practices guide on the EMI website. That's intended to be an open source, kind of open forum resource for everyone. And we would love to see people kind of adopt those standards and practices because we know that they can make your operation better if you adhere to those, those standards and practices. But we define, uh, or when we talk about management of digital assets, the important, there are a couple of important considerations. One, digital evidence is subject to the exact same secure chain of custody requirements and considerations as we do physical evidence. It is incredibly important that digital evidence be protected, that it be safeguarded, that we be able to attest to the security and authenticity of those files. The same principles of chain of custody apply directly. Uh, it is incredibly important that you're able to authenticate or prove the authenticity of your digital evidence assets or div digital evidence files. And we authenticate them in a couple of different ways. But basically, when we talk about authentication, we mean that in order to use this digital evidence item as evidence, we have to be able to prove or demonstrate that it is a true copy of the original. It is not important that digital evidence be the actual original source data. You know, if you take a picture on a cell phone at, at uh, you know, in patrol, you don't have to turn in the whole cell phone. That's the original source data. But what you do have to turn in is a, a true copy of the original data. And that needs to go through a process where you can attest to or account for the authentic nature of that file. It's generally going to be a background process that you don't have to worry about. But a term I'd like to throw out just to make you familiar with is, is a hash algorithm. And that is one way of authenticating a digital evidence asset to make sure that it is a true copy of the original. So if you don't have authentication measures in place with your DME or your digital evidence uh, storage, it is really important that you look into that and be able to authenticate that. I can say if you're just using a file folder in, uh, in, in Microsoft's whatever they call their OS now, uh, that's not going to be an authenticated okay. asset. Uh, it's, it just sits on a server. And that's, that's a terrible, terrible place for, for digital evidence, just the file folder on your computer. Uh, it's also important to think about authentic authentication as, a, as an upstream and a downstream process. Uh, we want to authenticate the evidence going into the system and prove that it is a true and accurate copy of the original. But it's equally as important to be able to authenticate that the asset that you're exporting is also authentic. So if that is just gibberish to you, uh, send me an email. I'd love to talk about it in the future uh, with a little more specificity. But, but in the interest of time, evidence authenticity is incredibly important. Security is also important. It's incredibly important that we are able to limit access to these files to only those who need to have access. We should be able to track that access. So however you store your evidence, you should have security measures in place that limit access to authorized users and track the access of that authorized use or access uh, in real time. Digital evidence security measures should also prevent unauthorized duplication or deletion or alteration or exporting of those files or items. It's really important for a myriad of reasons, but you don't want your department or your agency's uh, critical digital evidence being leaked out, or you don't want to have that capacity or functionality uh, in your system where someone could just send a file if they feel like it. Uh, that, is, that is not a good practice. One of the key differences, in fact, the most important difference about digital evidence and what makes it truly distinct from physical evidence is access. Digital evidence is different in, this, in the sense that we want to give digital file access. We want to give access to digital evidence in real time to our investigators. If you've got a digital evidence management system, you can provide real time, secure, authorized access to investigators. When you think about it, if you've got four or five people taking photographs of a crime scene and you've got one investigator that's the primary investigator that investigator needs access to all those files there should be one repository where you can go and have access to those files in real time as they're loaded without compromising the integrity of the evidence or creating other additional chain of custody issues so it's really important that if you if you take digital evidence in that it's accessible real time to your investigators and for your end users that, that need it. 
Um, otherwise, it just creates a problem for you and the investigators, and it doesn't doesn't solve any of our problems. Um, hey, Sean, uh, just real quick, some of the uh, viewers are saying that your mic it might be down just a little bit if you might increase your volume just a tad. Thank and, you so much. Is that better? Folks, yeah. Folks, if you're having a hard time hearing Sean or if it's better now, please let me know. And I hope that's better. Definitely. So if it's not, yeah, please do, because I play with those little buttons all day long when I'm on phone calls. So thank you so much for that input. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of notes on digital evidence sources. We can't cover this in a day. We can't cover this in a week. Technology, as we mentioned earlier, evolves more rapidly than policy or procedures or practices can typically maintain pace. But it's really important that your agency is prepared for the curve, for both storing current types of DME for legacy files and playing legacy files, and also looking forward into the future for emerging digital evidence sources. It's difficult to explain what you need to look for, but you can usually watch your children and they will be able to, to point you in the direction of, of the next thing in digital evidence. Because chances are, once it becomes a popular consumer technology, it's gonna be used somehow in a crime. That just always seems to be the case. So we need to be prepared to store it. Absolutely. When we, when we talk about digital evidence sources, there, there are too many to list, but very common sources are optical media like CDs or DVDs or Blu-rays, uh, flash or solid state drive storage, basically the, the little USB cards that you plug into your computer, uh, SD cards and XD cards that you can pop into a phone or another type of device. My favorite digital evidence source is just source to server where it's a direct upload of assets like mm -hmm. digital photos or body cam video or in-car video. Source to server stuff is is my favorite because it's very clean. But there are also going to be digital evidence sources that we store and we keep in our facilities that are hardware stored data. You know, a CPU that we've seized from a crime scene, a cell phone that we've seized, even vehicle systems uh, on, especially on more advanced machinery and vehicles, there are going to be hardware that stores data on those devices that you might need to take in as evidence and store in your property room. So we need to be prepared for digital evidence to exist on physical sources that we can't really control or enumerate, but also servers and, and CDs and DVDs that we have to export. Uh, and then secondary source or extracted data sources. If you've got a Cellbrite machine or what's it, was it Gray? Gray Key is the new one for Gray. Apple. The, so that, yeah, there's a new emerging technology for Apple phones for extracting Apple phones and, and that's gray key, but that that secondary source, whether it's Cellbrite or gray key or any any provider like that, uh, that's another digital evidence source that we need to learn how to manage and store. And when we talk about managing and storing digital assets or digital evidence, there are, there are really three key features that are important. One, that it preserves the integrity of the original data, that it keeps an authentic, true copy of the original data on file, online, and available for future use. It provides future access to the stored data for the entire duration of custody. Now, if you've got a case, a homicide case from 1982, and it was filmed on a VHS or a beta recorder, but you don't have a beta playback or a VHS playback mechanism, then you don't have that direct access to that stored data. So we encourage you, if you've got all those old preserved assets that you retain the ability to play those files or at least retain access to find someone that has a VHS, like maybe your grandmother or an elderly aunt, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of people that still have VHS out there. It's important that you'd be able to access it for the entire duration of custody. That means if it's a homicide case and you've got a VHS file on that case, you're probably going to need to keep a VHS player around until you don't need that file anymore. As far as physical storage of digital evidence, which is my least favorite thing in, well, there are a lot of least favorite things, but really it's important to consult the manufacturer of that media for storage conditions and optimal preservation conditions. One thing that a lot of people don't realize about physical digital evidence, like CDs and DVDs that you buy and burn off onto a disc to store your evidence. Those have a very limited shelf life or they have a limited shelf life. Even the industry designs and intends those things to last about 10 years at a maximum. Now contrast that with a, a DVD that you buy for that's got a Disney movie on it. It's a different 
uh, it's a different process for burning the disc and, and producing that disc. So it lasts a lot longer. So it's really important that you store evidence, digital evidence in, on a medium or, or a, a platform that's designed to last the length of the, the, the required duration of storage for that item. If you're storing DVDs or optical discs or any kind of digital evidence, it's a good idea to incorporate protective packaging measures into your evidence submission process. Those might be providing sleeves for disc media for officers or shielded packaging for electronic devices, Faraday bags that are anti-static. Yeah, for cell phones. And it's also real quick, there's a difference between a Faraday bag and a Faraday bag. Uh, some Faraday bags are designed to enclose the bag and pr prohibit it from sending a signal outside the bag. But there are also Faraday bags, and I know this because I made the mistake, I ordered a bunch of Faraday bags and I realized that they were just static shield bags. They had no radio blocking capacity whatsoever. So don't just buy Faraday bags and think you're good. Make sure it's the it's right type brand. of Faraday. Yeah, absolutely, it's just a brand. So uh, as far as general guidelines, with physical evidence, phys physical digital evidence, we treat it very similarly to the way we would any other type of evidence. We want to keep it from heat. We want to keep from high levels of humidity or fluctuation in either of those. Physical digital evidence degrades when it's exposed to direct sunlight, when it's exposed to dust, when it's exposed to static electrical charges, or if you drop it and break it, it's gone. Volatile chemicals can damage the data on those surfaces as well. If you handle it a lot, if uh, the oils from your skin can degrade the, the structure of that, that, that surface and make it unusable for you. And if you've got an old VHS vault at your agency, of course, that kind of magnetic storage media is, should be protected from, from uh, magnetic fields. It doesn't, uh, I can't remember the show that they went in with the electromagnet, but Really, that doesn't apply to DVDs Breaking and CDs. Bad. There you go. Yeah. So, so you can't <laughs> can't really do that anymore. My favorite thing in the whole wide world is electronic scalable digital evidence cloud storage. And some people are afraid of cloud storage. The prevailing guidance with digital evidence storage for years in law enforcement was I have to store this on a physical server behind my locked door at my police department. That's the only way I can keep my data secure. Well, that was an illusion. And I think anyone that's been taken over by a ransomware virus uh, stored on a secure network at their, in their IT server room will know that, that that was a false sense of security. I encourage people to use cloud storage for everything, not just storage of your assets and, at, and information, but for the apps that they run on. It's incredibly important that we start migrating to cloud-based apps and cloud-based storage that provide real-time backup for all of your data uh, because the servers will fail. Um, it's also important to keep a large enough storage capacity to preserve all the evidence and data that you're going to get without data loss. So scalable storage, storage that can increase as you need it. I had a friend that was a detective here in Texas and he called me up and said, hey, we just got a surveillance footage or surveillance footage on a case, a homicide case, and the, the file size was like 12 or 14 terabytes, which is roughly the same size as Netflix's capacity. Well, there's petabytes, never mind. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but 14 terabytes is a, you can't put that on a server. You can't upload that up any pipe. Uh, so you got to do something with it. So evidence, digital evidence is growing in both in terms of bandwidth and, and, and number. So we need to be ready to store that and find ways to store those big file sizes. Now, even though that particular situation doesn't apply, you couldn't put 14 terabytes on a server platter uh, or upload it. So we had to find an alternate arrangement for those huge file sizes. Uh, but we've always got to be on the lookout for, for those things. And for those of you that are afraid of cloud storage, this is a fun fact. Now, I don't work for Amazon. I buy tons of stuff there. Uh, but I don't work for them and they don't pay me. But the thing to keep in mind about cloud durability and reliability is just, here's a note from Amazon's web services. I don't even think that this is their top of the line server provider. They're Amazon S3. It's got 99.9 .9, and there are 10 nines after that durability of objects every year. And what that means is 
they're 99.9999999999. All everything put on that platform is going to be there. And they expect an annual average loss in terms of their objects at 0.0000001% of objects. So what that translates to is if you put 10 million objects on an AWS platform, what you can expect as in terms of file loss is an average loss of one object every 10,000 years. That's one file every 10,000 years is your expected level of loss. You can't approach that with any other department-based, optical media-based, any other type of storage. Uh, you're not even going to come close to what you can find on Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. Uh, any of those cloud storage platforms are an order of magnitude better than what you're doing now if you're not storing it on the cloud. So when it comes to digital evidence retention, this is really important. Uh, digital evidence should be retained for the duration of custody, just like physical evidence. In fact, there are, there are laws where we have to keep digital evidence even longer than physical evidence in some states. But in order to dispose of digital evidence, it's important to remember that there's digital evidence to dispose of, but that needs to be approved and documented as well by an authorized source. There are platforms out there, or and this is especially common with in-car video, where the digital evidence goes onto the server and it's set for automated disposal. Well, that seems like a great thing. It seems like a beautiful thing. But conceptually, it's going to cost you in terms of evidence. Uh, it is really important that you have your policy written and you, you, you have your settings insured so that you're saving those files appropriately and we're, we're disposing of those files with appropriate authorization and intention. Uh, Automated disposition sounds like a good thing, but unless it is handled extremely well, it's going to result in file loss on a case and it's going to cost you evidence. So that is the caveat. So any anything you want to add about digital evidence, James? I just think it's really uh, important. A lot of these things that we're talking about, we really have no control over it in the evidence unit. So I think it's just important that Whatever software you're using, at least know that, that that your department's vetted it and that it has the ability to be kept uh, um, secure. And also just try and reach out to the folks that uh, work on your digital media in your, in your department. Try and gain a little bit more experience or red flag things that you might wanna look for when you see items uh, come through your evidence stream. And I think once uh, at least you, uh, hopefully everyone knows who they're, their uh, computer forensics folks are with their agency or if it's a private lab, but at least uh, know who the resource is when you have a problem and you need to reach out to them. Absolutely. And another thing I want to add, if you work in an agency or work in a state where evidence, digital evidence is primarily treated as a record, just count your blessings. Uh, yeah. I know that James in California, most digital files like in-car video or, or 911 calls, are those treated as records in California? Well, it's not treated as physical evidence until they put it on a disk, but that's okay. all supposed to go away. I mean, the, as the software's advancing, I think um, they're trying to make it paperless or make it uh, improve it so that you'd be able to log in remotely and, and view it, whether you're in court or making a copy or whatnot. So, Okay, outstanding. Well, it, if you don't have to deal with it, uh, if records deals with it, just just count your blessings. But what you probably will have to do with deal with is packaging. Yeah. Uh, so we'll hit packaging next. Packaging is a system. It's really important that we think of packaging as a system of, We've got because we've got three different parts at play. And when we talk about packaging, it's a system that fits inside of a bigger system. Uh, we want to package our items in a way that meets the needs of our evidence storage system as well. So when we, it's, it's kind of like, it, it's real difficult to to get toothpaste back in the tube. So if you don't have control over the way you package evidence, you're not gonna have any control over the way that you store evidence. And it's really important that those be in sync and planned out intentionally, and it starts with packaging. So that packaging system involves, like I mentioned, three different parts. The, the packaging method, evidence labeling and evidence seals, and we'll discuss all of those uh, this afternoon or right now. When it comes to packaging principles, a couple of things to think in, or keep in mind, excuse me, all items should be packaged and labeled and sealed. 
Uh, that's just a general principle. Now, I would put a little asterisk there because there are a few things that we're not going to package necessarily, especially large bulk items. But if cross-contamination of that evidence or if it is of probative forensic value, it needs to be packaged and sealed. Uh, that's That's regardless. I don't care if it's an airplane wing. If you've got biological evidence or you've got forensic evidence on that thing, it needs to be packaged. Now, there are ways to do that, uh, but things like bicycles that come in, if it's not a criminal case, it's not uh, it's not associated with anything, it's just found property, obviously we're not going to encourage you to package those, but uh, if, if you believe that there is probative forensic evidence related or on or in that item, then it needs to be packaged so that it can be protected from cross-contamination. Uh, we mentioned this in our previous class about a packaging manual. That's just become a given. But I like to look at packaging in, in this context of this little uh, diagram on the side. I mean, we want to preserve the item in its original condition, and we want to prevent cross-contamination. Those are the two overarching uh, principles at play in evidence preservation. And evidence preservation fits into that system. You can see packaging up there in the corner. The labeling is, a, is important in terms of preserving the item because if we don't know where that item came from, and that's, I think my mom calls every week at two <laughs> because she needs help getting on her Zoom call. Uh, Maybe she has a question on packaging. I'm pretty sure it's about Zoom. She's uh, <laughs> almost 80 and she's still a school teacher uh, here in town and loves her job. I don't plan on working when I'm 80. Uh, but uh, so the storage, the the method that we use to store evidence, the environment that we store evidence in, all incredibly important and part of that preservation process, but it begins with packaging evidence. And when it comes to packaging standards, these are a few things that we've written into our standards and best practices. They're things that we just believe are bedrock foundational principles of evidence packaging. Uh, your agency should establish packaging requirements that are based on the most appropriate method and material for packaging evidence. It's a great idea. It's a, it's a another bedrock principle that those packaging methods, that they're consistent with forensic lab requirements. Most of us that work at a municipal or a county agency or even a state agency, we're going to use a state lab or a county lab or a city lab that has very specific intake requirements for the evidence that they analyze. It's important that your packaging is consistent with those so that you're not finding yourself repackaging evidence for the lab when it needs to go to the lab. Evidence should be packaged using materials that will best preserve that item in the condition in which it was submitted. Um, that's not always possible, but that is a great principle to use. Evidence should be packaged in a manner that prevents cross-contamination of evidence. That has become more of an important concept as we understand the intricacies of biological evidence and finger, latent fingerprint evidence. Uh, those are concepts, that's why we package things to prevent cross-contamination because we don't want case evidence transferring, low cards principle transferring evidence from one case to the next because of the way we packaged our evidence. We believe and we preach in limiting the number of packaging options available for packaging evidence at your agency. Um, there are several underlying factors that, that contribute to that guidance. But remember, evidence is a system that fits within a system. And if we don't control the number of packaging options available, you will find officers packaging things in everything imaginable under the sun. Uh, so we want to limit those options because realistically, you can package evidence in two or three package types, and and really, you don't need that many types of packaging in order to be successful. Um, most evidence is going to fit in one of four types of containers, an envelope, a craft envelope. Uh, you know, might consider limiting your selection to three different sizes, maybe a 4 by 6 an 8 by 10 and a 10 by 13 I promise you that's going to fit 90% of the things that would go inside of an envelope. Similarly, craft bags, craft paper bags, consider limiting those to a, a 5 by 11 lunch bag, a medium bag, which is a 1 6 barrel bag. For those of you that remember grocery stores that had paper bags, that's the size of a grocery sack. And then those large 30-gallon lawn bags, especially for large format items that contain biological evidence, uh, th those 30-gallon lawn bags are pretty much what that kind of thing just goes into by default. 
And then you got cardboard boxes, dimensional cardboard boxes. I, I can't give you guidance on the sizes. It depends on the agency. It depends on the type of evidence that you get in, but we recommend three box sizes, small, medium, and large. We don't want to store air, but we don't also want to keep up 50 different box types that we have to order and continue to stock uh, on a routine basis. There are also specialty or fixed use containers that I encourage people to use, gun boxes that are specially designed for guns. And there's some really cool emerging technology with respect to gun boxes that's coming out. I'm not putting those in the class now, but just know that that's something cool that's happening. Uh, and we'll talk about that as soon as we have better, more definitive information. But knife boxes, heat seal tubing, and I put a little asterisk by heat seal tubing because uh, that was manufactured originally by the devil. And it can be used to horrible effect when done wrong. So uh, we'll make some specific caveats about heat seal tubing. It's terrible for biological evidence. It's terrible for anything made of metal. Uh, but there are some very specific use cases like James. Uh, I mean, they package in California, they package all their dope, all their narcotics inside heat seal tubing. Perfect use case for heat seal tubing. Almost, almost. Package the the dry narcotics. Uh, marijuana, if it's fresh marijuana, we always put that in those those large uh, we call them narc bags uh, that you uh, just displayed. And the the key to that is just punch a few holes in it so you don't get a bunch of mold in your uh, in your evidence room. But Absolutely. yeah, definitely all unknown narcotics should go in heat sealed bags, especially if it's considered for fentanyl. And uh, if anyone needs packaging guides for fentanyl, please feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to send you some guides on that. Yeah, narcotics are a perfect use case for heat seal tubing. Uh, every other type of evidence under the sun is not. Uh, so Sharps containers are great. Uh, it's probably my preference is you, you train your officers, don't bring those in. Uh, there are very, very <laughs> few times when, when you actually need Sharps evidence. If they were trying to file a dope case on a guy that has one squazillionth of heroin inside of a needle, maybe in your state that that's something that happens, uh, but I would encourage them better luck next time uh, because yeah. it's very difficult to get a measurable amount or a testable amount out of the end of that syringe when you know it's been sticking in that junkie's arm uh, for Lord knows how long and sitting under the, the floorboard of their car for even longer. So another option, specialty use is craft paper wrapping. If you've got extremely large format uh, evidence with biological contamination or biological evidence or other probative forensic evidence on it, wrapping those in craft paper is always an option. Uh, so that's that's another thing to consider. Um, when it comes to picking materials for packaging, there are, these are the things you need to work at. Durability, conformity, frequency, visibility, suitability. Durability, it needs to be durable enough to last. It needs to conform. Conformity, it needs to conform to lab requirements. You pick your packaging based on the frequency of the times that your agency has to package something like that. If you're an agency that never gets handguns because you are in another country or something, I don't know. I, I can't think <laughs> of it on the, on the tip of my head or wherever. I can't even think of an idiom. Uh, so, you know, base your packaging on the frequency of, of the number of times that you package those item types and then visibility. I hate tiny, tiny packages. I love tiny, tiny little containers. Those are neat, but tiny, tiny packages get lost. So make sure that you package it in something large enough to see and large enough to scan. And then suitability. This is where plastic heat seal tubing becomes a problem because Heat seal tubing is inappropriate as a, as a packing medium for biological evidence. It, anything that's metallic or subject to oxidation or mold growth should not be packaged in plastic heat seal tubing. <clears throat> when it comes to labeling, and I won't go into labeling in too great a detail. We'll just hit the high points here. But the basics of labeling are, one, the barcode itself, the actual symbol barcode on the label. The material that you use, the backing of the label and the printing of the label, they, they have to be legible and they have to contain all the data that you need to use. And then a few standards. We recommend the following. We recommend a polypropylene label stock, which is basically not a paper label, but a polypropylene. Uh, it's a polyester label stock that you use. And the reason we recommend this is because polypropylene will last forever. 
they use polypropylene labels on oil field pipe. Um, if you, we have to store evidence in a myriad, a number of different con conditions. You might store evidence in, in a frozen container or an outdoor storage that's going to be subject and exposed to UV radiation and light, or in the confines of your property room, which should be in a temperature controlled environment. You need a label material that's going to be able to withstand the rigors of each of those conditions. Uh, we recommend using resin or wax resin ribbons so that that stuff is legible and stays on the label for the duration of custody. And because of those two reasons, we recommend you use thermal transfer label printers uh, for printing labels and creating labels. And those labels have to have a permanent adhesive backing. Otherwise, you're going to have a property room that's littered with the shells and hulls of old labels that have used an inferior adhesive just throughout your property room. And that's that's not a good thing. Absolutely not. Your packaging manual should prescribe procedures for creating the labels and also placing the labels. Cops love to find creative ways to place labels in, in locations that are absolutely unusable. And when you're doing an inventory, if you're doing an inventory of an envelope location, you want all of those envelopes, the labels, to be placed at the top so you can scan through the system and, and zap it with the barcode scanner. It makes things more efficient. In order to do that, you have to put that in your packaging manual and you have to hold officers accountable for that as well. So I think my elbow hit that. So when it comes to labeling standards, again, materials that are going to be suitable for storage conditions that won't weather or degrade, that's going to be legible, that won't become detached during storage. Those are incredibly important. I hate to see evidence labels applied directly to evidence items. Uh, that's that's a, something we've written into our standards. Anything that will permanently deface or decrease the value or utility of an item, you should not put an evidence label on that surface. Evidence labels should contain sufficient information to identify that specific package using an agency control number. I mean, the label is there to individualize and identify and preserve the chain of custody of that single item. The label is incredibly important in that process. Um, if you've got buy a lot, here's my, I, how many least favorite things have I said today? But another least favorite thing, and this is something now that I am no longer employed as a police officer, I would almost commit murder when people would violate this. When they would store, biolog they'd submit biological evidence, but they wouldn't put a biological sticker on the outside of the package. Mm -hmm. And if it was described less than it should have been, you cut open this pack when it's time to dispose of evidence. Oh, there's a, a bloody sock. Uh, that was nice. It just said white athletic sock, and now it's covered in human blood. And I wore PPG, and I'm ready for it. But I would always find a special moment to share with a young officer when I would find things like that <laughs> under those circumstances. But that's why we put biological labels on things. That's why we put hazmat labels on evidence that is hazardous, because we owe it to our evidence custodians. We owe it to the agency. We owe it to everyone involved in the process to keep people safe. Um, and, and I know that resonates now in the in the time of COVID, but when this is all past and gone, uh, it's still important to label that stuff with a biohazard sticker uh, in perpetuity. I, we recommend selecting barcodes, uh, barcode symbols that are legible that provide accurate reading with scanners and devices, and that contain all the required information inside that little data string. Some of this gets into the weeds a little bit, but you wanna make sure that your, your barcode numbers and symbols are generated by a system that, that ensures that that number and that symbol is unique and individual to that specific item, that they aren't Absolutely. duplicated unintentionally or assigned to another item. That has to be a part of the system that, that never, ever happens. We ordered, before, I, before we made changes at our agency, we ordered barcodes in rolls. And we should have really just used Garanimal stickers. We should have had a purple panda and a purple panda and pulled one off, put it on the property sheet, and the other put it on the item because we didn't use barcode scanners until much later in the process. So essentially, we were matching Garanimal labels. Uh, but we ordered the wrong number of barcode labels at some point in the history of our agency in the past. Oh my God. And so we had a string of barcodes that were the same number on the same item and guess what barcode readers can't differentiate between which one you were talking about and there's yeah wow 
And I thought that I'd turn all those notifications off, but apparently not. How uh, many phones do you have? I have too many. Uh, let's see. And, 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 I'm, and I think I mentioned an elderly mother that doesn't know that I'm teaching the class from two to three and we're in the same time zone. Um, so I'll call her, I promise. Uh, you also want a translation of your barcode label. When the world goes to hell in a handbasket and your label makers or, or your printers are down, your computers are down, let's say you've made a paper list of evidence that you're looking for, uh, you need a barcode that has a translation of what that barcode means so that we can verify that that is the item we're talking about independently of technology. Technology is going to fail at some point. And when it does, we want to be able to independently verify that this is indeed the item that we're looking at and the item we're looking for. And if you put a translation of that barcode label, uh, oftentimes you're able to do that if you have a source document to work from. When it comes to seals, this is really simple. Uh, the, the basics of sealing, the intention of sealing is one, to close a package. That's pretty simple in and of itself. But we also want to detect tampering or access into that package or attempts into that package. Um, so we got to use the right materials and we got to use materials that are designed to meet the intended purpose. Um, so I believe that all evidence packages should be sealed to prevent unauthorized opening and detecting of tampering. So we do that in a couple of different ways. It's really important right now to discuss one thing really quick. You don't have to use tamper evident tape to close every box. In fact, if you have got a cardboard box that you're storing engine parts in and you try to seal that with tamper evident tape, it's going to drop on your foot because that type of tape is not designed to provide a mechanical seal to a package. Evidence packages should be mechanically sealed. That means they should be sealed to prevent opening. The way that you do that is with clear, heavy-duty adhesive tape, You, but we augment with tamper tape uh, because that really helps us detect unauthorized access. There are a couple of exceptions to all packages should be sealed. That would be One would be firearms evidence, which we'll discuss in a later class. But uh, we recommend sealing every package that comes in. The officer that submits the evidence needs to seal the evidence appropriately and two specifications. Um, we also recommend if you've got other packaging material that the, with seams that are vulnerable to unauthorized or undetected opening, seal those too. I mean, it, it, it can't hurt. Um, now, do you need to go to the, to the extreme of sealing every fold in, a, in an envelope? Probably not. Uh, you'll have to make that call based on the packaging that you're using. Evidence seal, seal should be inscribed by permanent ink. Don't use pencil, don't use ballpoint pen with the initials and identification number and packaging date of the person who packaged the item. You're never gonna be able to tell whose initials those are. Those are mine, uh, but you can tell that that badge number is 796, that's my badge number. Uh, the date that it was packaged on is clearly inscribed on the label. And on most of those package surfaces, the, 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 the signature is overlapping the tape to where if someone lifts that tape, it's going to be very obvious that someone had tried to lift that. Uh, and that's why we do it. So for best practices, again, clear heavy duty packaging tape is a great thing to use for sealing those boxes. When you're creating a, a cardboard box, make sure you seal the bottom of the box and initial it before you fill it. Uh, that's happened to me and it's uncomfortable and weird when you do that. So if you can learn from my mistake, please do. Uh, if you're gonna use tamper evident tape as a primary seal, use it only as a primary seal on light packaging. Use it as an additional security seal on boxes or, or large envelopes or bags. Uh, and then let the stuff dry before you mess with it too much. Anything, James? I'm just answering some questions here too. I have a few questions, so maybe I could review those real quick for you. So, uh, um, looks like Chad says a small amount of marijuana in a large mason jar. Any reason to keep the jar and not place the marijuana into a small envelope to be submitted? Uh, seems like a waste of space. And you're absolutely right, Chad. That is a waste of space. So, I, I can't think of any reason that you'd want to have that glass jar. Uh, it should all be documented in the officer's report as to how it was packaged at the time it was taken. So uh, in, in our agency, glass uh, mason jars are off limits. So if you yeah, can get away with that one. 
and you definitely, whatever you do, it needs to be prescribed in your packaging manual and your procedures, and there needs to be a procedure for it. Uh, a lot of times, if an officer brings in something like a mason jar that does just waste space, uh, if there's probative forensic evidence, let's say it's not marijuana, but something else in there, there might be latents on the jar. I mean, obviously there are always exceptions, but it's really important. The best time to take care of that is with the officer when they submit the evidence. You know, if they, sh we should train them not to submit the stuff in the jar, let the guy keep his mason jar, put the dope in another package and, and submit that because mason jars have not been outlawed. Uh, you know, so it's not really important that we take in the mason jar, but it's got to come in some kind of container. That, that's the best time. So Sean, we'll talk can you handle one more question? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, Amber asked us, uh, so would you say uh, just have officers photograph empty syringes for documentation and then disposing of them? Uh, we would not need to keep the actual syringe for paraphernalia charge? If we try to do this at our agency, and I would say that if you can get your court of record sign off, like take judicial notice and not submit any of those things. Uh, yes, absolutely. But because that silly, tricky constitution, some prosecutors are uncomfortable just photographing evidence unless there's a specific statute that authorizes that in the rules of evidence. But if your prosecutor will agree to use that or to just take a I mean, to let those cases just kind of drop if it comes to up into question uh, as just an acceptable level of risk. But you want to have your prosecutor sign off on that. And that needs to be in policy, not just between not just at your agency, but also that the, the courts, the judiciary and the prosecuting attorney's offices at whatever level they're at, that they agree to that in principle and that you have that in writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, because what Absolutely. you don't want to happen is you don't want to have a policy where you take photos of syringes and you have the one, you know, bright, legally minded junkie that's taking this to court and you've disposed of evidence. He was not able to be confronted with the evidence that was uh, used against him at trial. That can be a that can be a legitimate sticking point if you're not protected by policy. So. We look at evidence submission as a two-part process. This is something that's, these are pretty quick principles to go over. That that two-part process, is, there's a submission side for the officers and the intake side for evidence managers. We'll look at both sides of this. The evidence submission process begins with collecting that item out in the field through packaging and preparing the item for submission and then providing us complete documentation for the item and then transferring that to the custody of the evidence management unit. So that's the workflow for the evidence submission process. A couple of standards. Um, all items submitted to the evidence need to be documented and described. We shouldn't be receiving anything that we don't know what we're getting. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that, but I hate the words miscellaneous or various. You should just eliminate those words from the vocabulary of your evidence uh, custody practices forever because we're not, we're responsible specifically for what comes in. We're not responsible generically for what comes in. Um, all items should be packaged, labeled and sealed in compliance with procedures and evidence should be stored securely. And this, this refers to temporary storage. We need to provide temporary secure storage for these items that prevents cross-contamination. That means individualized segregated case storage for these items so that we prevent cross-contamination. We recommend that all evidence collected during a shift be submitted prior to the end of the shift. Now, obviously there are some times and some agencies and some use cases that would not uh, allow that to happen. Those are all individual, but as a general rule, if it's collected at the begin at, at, on, during the shift, it needs to be submitted prior to the end of shift. And this is in your notes, so I'm not gonna go over this, but for every item that is submitted, we need a evidence managers, the evidence custodian needs a report of that item that details all of this information. All the information on this list and it's available in your notes is critical for identifying that type of evidence and also eventually for disposing of the evidence and locating and notifying the owner of that evidence. Uh, that's just really, all that stuff is important. Is it evidence? Is it non evidentiary property? We need a detailed item description. All that is really important information to go along with that evidence. When we talk about documentation of evidence, this is something that I didn't think I would have to discuss. But when I talk about 
one package equals one item. There are six marbles in that picture. That's not six items. That is, that's all in one package. So it's one item. So I've heard of cases and know of cases where if you submitted 400 ball bearings, uh, they would put, they would write that down as 500 or 400 items for the intake process. And that really skews your disposition figures at the end of the year. Um, we teach that all items should be individually packaged. And, you know, a lot of people will bring in transients and they've got just bags and bags and shopping carts full of stuff. Um, if it is important enough to bring it in, it's important enough to individualize it and identify it individually. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. If there's a single known owner, all the items are like. If there's not a forensic case or not a criminal case that's associated with that evidence, uh, those are some exceptions. But it all needs to be packaged individually. Now, I think we can, we got, we got four whole more minutes and we can go to 301 and still be within that hour time frame. So when it comes to documenting evidence or describing evidence, here's an important principle. It is, items should be described sufficiently to specifically identify and individualize that item and distinguish it from other items. That item description should contain information that's related to the item type, the quantity of items in the package, the make, model, serial number, information, all the things that make that thing unique, it's important to describe in your documentation. I can't tell you how many evidence labels I've seen that say shoe. Um, well, shoe is not very specific. I couldn't tell you if there were three shoes lined up against one another, which shoe they were talking about. That specific shoe is a Converse high top, Chuck Taylor, a Chuck Taylor Converse all-star high top. It is size eight and a half. Uh, there are very specific distinguishing features that, that distinguish that shoe from any other shoe. One of the things that I would encourage you also to avoid is generic, avoid generic descriptors like miscellaneous, unknown, or various. You should strike that and prohibit that language from ever entering your property room because I can't tell you how many times I've cut into a package of miscellaneous personal property and it contained dope or a gun or some stolen credit cards or stolen property. We can't, we're responsible for the stuff individually, not generically. Uh, good rule of thumb for describing things and for explaining to officers how to describe of evidence is a lineup standard. If I am submitting this blue shoe right here, this blue Converse All-Star, I need to describe it so that it can be distinguished between the white All-Star and the gray All-Star. Or if I'm submitting this ring right here, this little blue stone ring, I need to describe that ring sufficiently so that I can read the description and, and pick it out of that rack of jewelry. Uh, it's really important that we use descriptive language that individualizes that item. We recommend a lot of location and sublocation fields, especially for like dope cases or, or criminal cases. You know, we found this knife. It was at 1704 Knipe. Uh, well, where did we find it? A sublocation would be the bedroom. So it's great to provide location and sublocation fields for your officers so that they know specifically where that item was retrieved. Um, I love using controlled or preset descriptors for item type, weight, my, uh, model, make, and serial numbers of things because you want to avoid free text descriptors in your database. They just make things very unclean. I mentioned last week that the word Glock could be spelled wrong about 470 different ways. Uh, if you use a, a drop-down menu with the word Glock, G-L-O-C-K, uh, and you don't allow them to free text, you're going to get the same clean database information every time. So on the intake side, here are some things that, that happen with evidence when they are put into the locker and we are pulling them out of the locker on the other side. The atoms should always be inspected. The best way to avoid getting crappy packaging by officers is to inspect things when they come in and by rejecting them immediately when they fail to comply. So basically inspected, rejected, accepted. We hope to skip from inspected to accepted but we want to inspect those items when we come in. We want to make sure that they conform to our policy requirements because if we don't inspect them then and we find out that they don't later, it's too late to ask them to repackage it four years from now when you're disposing of the evidence. You've already established a pattern and practice of doing things wrong. Um, so the intake process basically is 
receive it from the submitting officer, whether it's temporary locker or direct, inspecting the item, accepting it. Then if it's got to go for additional processing or correction, then there's a little feedback or return loop back to the officer. Um, and then we store it until we dispose of it. A couple of processes or a couple of facility things to think about. You need a place for officers to package evidence. Uh, you just need that for them in order to have that performance expectation. Ideally, you need temporary submission lockers for your officers or a 24 seven service window. If you've got that luxury, you need some way of cold storage or storing cold evidence temporarily that segregates evidence and, and prevents cross contamination. You need to provide an area for officers to submit bulk evidence that doesn't fit in lockers. It is a great idea to provide a correction locker, a secure locker that you can return evidence to the officers so they can make those corrections. They don't have to come in on their day off or their, their time off. And if you're not a 24 seven shop, it's just a great service to provide. And then on the other side of the locker is a process, an area to process that stuff. All of those things are equally important. Um, when it comes to evidence packaging, oversized evidence, basically this is the one evidence type that you don't necessarily have to package. But I will say if, if it is a probative forensic value that needs to be wrapped in craft paper, uh, that's just a great principle never to violate. There are a few other evidence types that might not need to be packaged, but anything that doesn't need to be packaged still needs to be labeled and it needs to have a label affixed to it. Um, you'll make those decisions as an agency. So next up, that is, we are, th we are one minute overdue. That is like <sighs> lightning speed. Next week, we're gonna talk about evidence storage and we're gonna talk about organization, which to me is another one of my favorite things to think about or talk about. And we're also gonna talk about evidence disposition, another really important uh, concept uh, for evidence managers. If you have feedback, if you have questions, you have concerns, don't hesitate to contact me at sean at evidencemanagement.com. Uh, we'll, I welcome your feedback your questions, your concerns. We're gonna use those to make this experience better for you. There are certain things that we're just not gonna do. I'm not gonna shave. Uh, so if that's <laughs> something that's that's a non-negotiable. But other than that, we wanna make this useful for you. We wanna make it a valuable learning experience for you. And we want the information to be relevant and applicable to you. So that is technically the end of this session. If you have questions, we will answer those kind of now. Uh, and we'll stay on the line as long as there are questions to answer, but yeah. this is the end of this session. We're going to cut it off here. So if you want to drop off, thank you for being here. We'll see you next, thank you. Uh, next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Awesome. So do we have any questions? Um, let's see here. Not nothing at this point. So yeah, it looks like we're good. Thank you, everyone who's still here. I appreciate your time and thanks for oh, hanging out. And here's, a couple, yes, here's, here's a couple okay. at the bottom. If evidence is improperly packaged and needs to be repackaged, is there a need to save the improper packaging for chain of custody purposes? I would say this. Uh, generally, yes. I mean, because the, the improper packaging contains chain of custody data that's inherent to the item when it was improperly packaged, the time that it was originally sealed, the date that it was originally sealed. I mean, if it's just a completely botched packaging operation, I like to see people keep that. If you don't want to do that, if you want to repackage it pristinely and have it look all pretty and beautiful, make sure that you have a procedure and a written policy in place to protect you because that original packaging is important. It, it provides a chain of custody document in and of itself that speaks to the history of that item. Uh, I recommend keeping it. I mean, would you agree, James, or do y'all do things? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome. And you're welcome. And let's see. The only thing I wanted to bring up is uh, a couple things, uh, some special handling type stuff. Like we uh, we book in tasers. We'll use knife boxes for tasers because it protects the uh, the uh, biological evidence on the tips of the probes, and it also uh, protects us from getting uh, you know stabbed or poked. If you were to put a taser prongs inside of an envelope, it could per uh, burst through. And then the second uh, special handling type stuff is um, vapes. Vape pipes are very unique because if it's evidence, 
you want to just ensure that the batteries are taken out so you don't start a fire in your unit. Um, and we always package them in boxes as well so it doesn't accidentally get uh, the, the mechanism depressed and, and start uh, atomizing and start a fire. Uh, evidence is a little different. You want to be able to at least show that the batteries are still intact and they were working at the time it was taken. Uh, and then, of course, the narcotic, whatever the fluid is, you want to protect that inside of the box as well. So just a little bit of a different uh, packaging standard for some unique items that, that come through our evidence stream, at least. Absolutely. And we'll discuss a lot of those when we talk about different item types. Got a question here, a great question about how do you deal with ride refusal items when the submitting officer doesn't work during office hours? How do yeah. you refuse that item and return it to the officer through secure means when your shifts don't overlap and the thing that i love methods, yeah. the thing that i love to see is an evidence correction locker that you provide as a service to your officers for correcting that evidence and basically a correction locker it can be as simple as a box you know i mean it doesn't these don't have to be grand but it's got to be secure storage you got to be able to lock it the only person that has access to that lock and the master lock makes a reasonably good although i can defeat it. Uh, they make a reasonably good resettable combination lock. I mean, the, the, the gold standard would be an automated lock that you digitally control, but anything that you control the combination where he has the combination, you have the combination. He's the only one that can access the evidence. You're the only one that can, can retrieve it. Uh, that keeps the chain of custody pristine. And, and as long as that's documented on your chain of custody about the item, that way you can get it back to the officer. And, you know, our agency and most agencies, the evidence unit is not a 24-7 operation. Now, there are agencies, larger agencies where it is, and that's not an issue for them. But for agencies like the one I worked at, we provided those correction lockers, and it's it was a great service to provide to the officers and it also helped us get our stuff back and corrected much more rapidly because once we had a mechanism where we have we have done everything we can do to get it to them then we had the expectation that they were going to fix those issues and we didn't let them linger uh, so that was that that for me is one you have any other ideas james uh, what we, we what we do in our unit is we we actually accept it put it into a location that we hold for discrepancy, send the first email off. They're required to come during our business hours and make the correction to it. Second or third email starts going up the chain. So usually we get a, a, a relatively quick response. We wanna be able to be there to show them exactly what mistake they made or if they have any questions. So that's kind of like why we opted not to use those amnesty lockers. Um, and also because we have 14 different collection locations. So they'd have to come to our main office in order to make the correction. Okay, got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, I think I think this is referring to the drug boxes like the 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 citizen drop off drug boxes if I'm if I'm reading the question wrong, send me an email or let me know. But when it comes to drug boxes, would you repackage or just evidence tape the original box? My first caveat is like plastic heat seal tubing Community drug boxes were an invention of the devil, and they were designed to uh, to make our lives worse yes, uh, in every possible sense of the word. But it, if you really want to do drug boxes right, there are some things that you can do, and we'll discuss them when we talk about narcotics. But since we've got a couple of minutes, I would never approach a drug box without an escort or a witness. Yeah. I would prefer to approach that drug box under video surveillance and be under constant video surveillance for the entire time because inside that drug box is all kinds of stuff that we can't hold anyone accountable for. We don't know what it is. We're not going to identify the substances in there. So it's entirely contingent on your agency's policy and procedure. This is one thing. If your agency is going to make you do this because they're bad people and they don't love you, um, then you need to have a very specific policy and procedure that authorizes exactly what you're what you're supposed to do and governs exactly what you do uh, do with that item step by step by step. And whether it's repackaging it or just taping the original box, the less involvement and interaction you can have with that box in order to make it sealed and secure, the better. Uh, 
because it violates every principle of evidence management. The drug boxes just violate every principle of evidence management. Is it a great service? Maybe, <clears throat> but that's really something the firefighters should do. I think we should just leave that to them. Yeah, and 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 make sure you have some Narcan too when you're busting open that that locker to make sure there's uh you don't get exposed and hopefully yeah. have a second person with you too. Absolutely, because fentanyl. I mean, one of the common legitimate use cases of fentanyl are, are pain patches. You know, pain and, patches. You and know, the life that, treatment. That's crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. So, is it smart? I got another question. Is it smart to have a review date worked in the evidence booking label, or should the system, or should it? or should be a, an internal system thing for the evidence manager. I don't recommend a review date necessarily being on the label itself, but I definitely believe in review dates being intrinsically kind of worked into the system. You know, that's something that you set up and you can kind of set it up by crime type. I mean, if it's a misdemeanor, the review date should be, depending on your jurisdiction in Texas, the misdemeanor statute of limitations is two years in other places it's one year or 30 days. So if I've got a misdemeanor case, I want to put the, the review date automatically based on the crime type. I'm going to set that at one year. Uh, even though it's got a two-year run on the statute of limitations, I know that most misdemeanors are adjudicated within 12 to 14 months, so I'm going to start that review process early on. Um, that needs to be integrated into the system and really set an index to crime type uh, or offense type. Uh, that's that's a best practice. Mm -hmm. um, are clear plastic, plastic bags appropriate to use when not for DNA sharps? I mean... I hesitate to say no, but generally clear plastic bags are, they're difficult to store, they're difficult to order, they're difficult to, to preserve the condition or prevent crushing or prevent, so, and they're difficult to label. So I'm, I'm never going to just come out and jump for joy about using plastic heat seal tubing or clear plastic bags. I mean, I'm sure there are use cases out there, and if it works for your agency, great. But for most agencies, what it creates is a, st a, a storage system that's based on the principles of sedimentary rock, uh, because those things just <laughs> flop everywhere and you can't store them upright. They're a mess. Uh, if you, with, go ahead. If you're using it as a safety buffer, you know you're putting that that sealed um, uh, that sealed tubing into a Manila envelope or craft envelope, then then that becomes part of your primary packaging. But, but just to, to throw an item in there and put it on your shelf, I don't see the benefit of that at all. But that's a great question. So how do you package and store swabs? Usually your lab will provide very specific guidance on buckle swabs or any other type of swabs. I would consult your lab manual for packaging those. There are a couple of different ways to do it. Generally, there is a procedure for collecting the swabs that you want to follow and a procedure for packaging the swabs. Most little swab boxes have a little standoff tab to where you actually dry the swab as you package it. But the really the best guidance, and it might seem like a cop-out, is consult your lab for packaging and storage of, of swabs because they're going to provide you the guidance that you need. Um, as far as a brand name for resettable combination lockers, Masterlock makes a locker that has a resettable combination. The better the lock, uh, the higher security, the functionality of lock is. I'm going to do, I'll do some research. I know that I can, I mean, one of my hobbies, because I'm a dork, is lock picking. I mean, I became fascinated with lock picking when I started researching security methods. And I found out that I could pick the locks on all of the evidence stores at a number of evidence facilities around the country. Uh, so I recommend high security locks, high grade non-commercial or non-consumer non locks. But right Medico. now those little, those little Medico is beautiful. Uh, Asa Abloy, they make beautiful <laughs> products. Uh, but the little master lock, and I can't get the, it's, I can't remember the model number, but they make a suitable alternative especially if you're trying to get something off the ground to, to put in your officer's hands, you know, in a week or two, those are 15, 20 bucks, a little locker enclosure box, uh, you know, for a hundred bucks, you can, you can create a, a return locker. Yeah. Let's see question. I'm going to have to read through this one. Another question about incorrect prac, uh, incorrect packaging. So it takes an item, and I'm going to read and move my lips at the same time. 
Yeah, I think this is a this is a good question, and it I want to make a distinction. When I'm talking about chain of custody purposes, and the reason that I recommend keeping packaging on mispackaged or poorly packaged or, or packages that need to be redone, um, because on that evidence package uh, that is submitted incorrectly, there are going to be some some physical chain of custody indicators the date on the seal or the the signature you know all of these can speak to the actual custody history of that item so even though the location in a computer system is going to show temporary locker or return locker we're not worried about the chain of custody you know the 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 electronic record we're worried about physical manifestations of chain of custody i mean i try to look at custody in a 360 degree arena which incorporates and, and includes physical manifestations of chain of custody. Evidence seals are part of that. Uh, poor packaging is a part of that. I mean, if you've got a if you've got a, a documented history that this item was packaged incorrectly, you want to be able to substantiate the type of incorrect packaging that was performed. Was this incorrect packaging that invalidated the forensic uh, viability of the evidence inside? Probably not. But you want to be able to prove that because you still have that physical manifestation of that that chain of custody. So that probably, and I'm not sure what DOS medications is. What do we do with DOS? Drop, is, that, is that drop off something? Drop off medicine? Disc operating system, like Bill Gates. <laughs> so I doubt it. If, if it's, I'm not sure what DOS is. So if you want to email either of us directly, and and maybe, uh, maybe we could answer that a little more. A lot of great questions. I love them. I, I, I could do this one all day. Okay, and, and a little clarification. He was asking, one, the question about the box was asking more about a suspect box with a bunch of stuff inside it. Yeah, I mean, I would say if it's a, if it's in a suspect vehicle and you find a, a box with a lot of stuff in it, those need to be packaged individually. You can't just put a label on that box. Uh, that all of that needs to be packaged and sealed individually and protected from cross contamination, not necessarily from the items inside the box, but from the other items that they're going to be stored adjacent to. Yeah, Tina was uh, talking about uh, death on scene. That's her DOS, DOS. Oh, medications from a, a dead a dead person call. It really depends on the circumstance of their death. I mean, by dead on scene, I'm assuming that you're referring to like a medically unattended natural cause death. Mm -hmm. What most jurisdictions do, and there's probably some guidance in your specific state statutes related to drugs. I can give you an example from what we do in Texas. When the medical examiner rules that drug medications or medications, whatever was collected at the scene, when they rule that it's natural cause, we are authorized in our jurisdiction to immediately dispose of that evidence. So if we've got, you know, unattended deaths, medical deaths, you know, deaths where the, the cause is been determined and signed off by a medical examiner, most of the time under most circumstances, those are, uh, those are eligible for disposition but your policy needs to reflect that. Now, if it's another type of death, maybe a suicide or maybe a suspicious circumstance death or a death where they they can't identify the cause of death or it, it, there is an unnatural cause, uh, that's something you might have to keep longer, but I'm assuming that that's what we're, we're talking about. Yeah, I'm responding as well. Okay, very cool. Looks like we answered. Uh, and there's a couple more questions uh, about spelling the name of those other brand locks. Send me an email if you wouldn't mind. But uh, Medico is M-E-D-E-C-O. Uh, right. uh, Asa Ablo is A-S-S-A-A-B-L-O-Y. But I could have both spelled both of those wrong um, just right in front of you. So, okay, there we Medico go. Are, Medico are the, are the padlocks that we use, the high security padlocks that come with the credit card style uh, uh, recoding device. Yeah, basically, the high security locks don't come from Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, right. You know, it, I mean, Medico is a great brand. Uh, 
Asa Abloy is a great brand, brand but you basically, a, a high, the, the way you can tell that a lock is high security, just a good rule of thumb, is if you can't buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's, that's that's your first indicator. But if you've got to get the thing re-keyed, if you lose your key for it, they shouldn't be able to make a key for it at Home Depot yeah. or Lowe's. Yeah. So if either of those conditions are, are not satisfied, then it's probably not a high security lock. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's got all the questions kind of answered uh, that we had on the screen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those of you that stuck around for the question and answer time. Uh, always happy to answer your questions and to use this time uh, as a resource. If I've missed some of your questions, uh, send me or James an email and we'd be happy to answer them offline. So have a great week. Next Absolutely. week is evidence storage and disposition. Uh, Y'all have a great, great weekend. Absolutely. Have a good night, too. Take care, Sean. Thanks, James. Thank you so All much. All right. Take care.